Okay, um, kia ora koutou, ngā mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Warm greetings to you all and thank you very much for taking the time to join today's seminar. A uh, special thanks to Avril, Esther and Trudy for the kind invitation to present today. Um, my kōrero today is titled Love and Politics, Rethinking Biculturalism and Multiculturalism in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and my kōrero is primarily based on a chapter I wrote for this book, um, Mana Tangata Rua, Mixed Heritages, Ethnic Identity and Biculturalism in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which was published earlier this year. Um, my chapter title was the same heading as um, the heading for today's seminar. Um, but before proceeding any further, a brief biographical note is warranted because to understand my kaupapa requires understanding a little bit about my whakapapa. Um, I was born in Aotearoa, New Zealand in 1991 to an ethnically Thai mother and an ethnically Chinese father. Um, but unfortunately, both sides of my family were caught up in the Cambodian genocides of the 70s orchestrated by the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot. Um, Khmer Rouge is literally French or Red Cambodians or followers of the um, Cambodian Communist Party at the time. Um, and the Khmer Rouge advocated amongst others an ideology of fear and hatred of the other, or more specifically, a fear and hatred of the ethnic other, in particular, the Chinese, Thai and Vietnamese. Um, to the point of their execution. It's estimated that three million people lost their lives in just under four years of Khmer Rouge rule, um, and up to half by execution. Some members of my family are among those three million lives needlessly lost. There are other members of my family whose fates remain unknown to this day and perhaps we may never know whether or not they survived. Those who did survive, however, fortunately resettled in Aotearoa as refugees from the early 1980s. And with this milieu in tow, there are two broad and related concerns at the heart of my work. The first is a philosophical one, in light of the Khmer Rouge's reign of terror, a question that preoccupies me is, what is my relation to the other, human and otherwise? It's a question that I think is of great import in an era of climate change, Trumpism and Brexit, or right-wing populism and nationalism more broadly. It seems to me that what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history, generally speaking. The second concern is a desire to reinvigorate discussions about how biculturalism and multiculturalism might be pursued simultaneously going forward in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm infinitely indebted to Māori and Pākehā, without whose aroha and manakitanga my family would not be here today, and nor would I. Yet I find myself facing an ethical political dilemma, one of many in life more broadly in relation to biculturalism and multiculturalism. How can I be faithful to biculturalism and yet keep space open for others? Um, before delving further into these questions, I think it's necessary to sketch very briefly some of the perspectives that circulate around biculturalism and multiculturalism. Uh, excuse me, sorry, someone um, someone out there has got their mic on. Can you just mute your mic? Sorry. We've got a very unusual sound occurring. Um, so, in a nutshell, biculturalism and multiculturalism are often conceptualised as antagonistic, incompatible and competing frameworks in Aotearoa. On the one hand, biculturalism is said to be too exclusive when understood as a relationship between the country's founding cultures, Māori and Pākehā, as formalised most notably through the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. Formulated on these terms, biculturalism apparently excludes non-European immigrant groups. 
On the other hand, multiculturalism is criticized for being too inclusive. Under a multicultural framework, Māori could become just another ethnic minority amongst many, and thereby denigrating the status, rights, and claims of Māori as tangata whenua. Um, some suggest that there is a preference for multiculturalism over biculturalism due to and to escape anxieties that excessive bicultural demands could disrupt Pākehā hegemony. Others argue that multiculturalism is tentative and cannot be addressed until prior bicultural commitments to Māori have been addressed. Then, of course, there's the whole diversity at the cost of unity versus unity at the cost of diversity debate, um, to which Don Brash, for example, would side with the latter. Brash and others argue that the recognition of cultural differences through bicultural or multicultural frameworks detracts from a shared sense of national identity or unity. The way forward is apparently a one law for all approach. Um, and then there are others like Gareth Morgan, who responding to Brash's 2004 Oreo speech in 2015, declared that the treaty and by extension biculturalism, and I quote, relates to all of us and is always going to be a part of our lives. So how might we respond to the treaty relationship and increasing cultural diversity in Aotearoa in light of these diverse perspectives and as a result what some might perceive to be an impasse in relation to biculturalism and multiculturalism? Um, I want to turn now to proposing one possible way, emphasis possible, um, way in which we might accommodate both bicultural and multicultural interests in Aotearoa. Um, my aim is not to outline a prescription for simply harmonious bicultural and multicultural relations. Instead, I offer a philosophical response to the ethical political dilemmas posed by sociological issues of biculturalism and multiculturalism. In my work, I bring Eastern and Maori thought into conversation with the ethical political philosophies of Jewish French post structuralist philosophers Emmanuel Levinas and Jacques Derrida. I hope the thoughts that follow provoke critical reflection on existing dominant ways of thinking about the other, ethics and politics, and exclusion and inclusion in particular. I hope that these thoughts lovingly provoke a migration from the familiar homeland to resettle in a more partial, relational, and contested territory that lies beyond the horizon. As should be clear shortly, I argue for the tensions, contradictions, and ambiguities that others might see as problematic. Okay, so I want to start with the other. Um, I want to suggest that no identity is self-contained. Rather, it is partially through the existence of another that any identity at all is possible. For example, I become a brother only because of the gift that is my sibling or siblings. The life of the husband is bestowed upon me only because of the spouse or partner to whom I am wed. And what of manuhiri without tangata whenua? Um, but the other for me is not limited to denoting just the other human being. Um, the other more broadly is the constitutive outside of any identity whatsoever. For instance, exclusion to inclusion, betrayal to love, injustice to justice, or biculturalism to monoculturalism and multiculturalism, and vice versa. These are these things, these ideas, too, don't just simply exist on their own or in isolation. 
rather they come into being in relation to what is partially otherwise. It is the other that gives me to being. The other makes life meaningful. I mean, it's usually around about this time where people tell me that I'm reinforcing binaries. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about this. Um, because is anyone familiar with this symbol? Yeah, yin and yang. Um, it's a symbol that was very prominent in my household growing up. Um, and it's taught me a lot about, I guess, subjectivity. How everything cannot exist on its own, but is always about this relationship with something otherwise than itself. I mean, I think we see this in, in this um, symbol. Uh, but what I also find really interesting is that, yes, the, I suppose, black and white, are separate, but yet there is an inseparable relation between them. And what's also interesting, I think, is that they contain the seeds of their opposite within them. Um, and so I guess my goal is not so much to preserve these pairs or binaries, if that's what you want to call them. Um, but rather to try and resist a simple, single truth. Um, and as will hopefully become clear shortly, and also to expose the blind spots, to acknowledge unacknowledged assumptions that operate. Um, and for me, it's not about an either or, but a both and. That both sides, or all three sides, or four sides, or five sides, however many sides there may be, that all of these sides are somewhat true, are somewhat necessary, are somewhat important, even if that view is contradictory. Um, and I think for Eastern thought, binaries, again, I'm not sure if binaries is the right term, but if that's what we're going to use, binaries in Eastern thought aren't static. It's not always privileging one side over the other, generally speaking. Um, but in Eastern thought, it's not about absolutes, it's about needing both sides. And that both sides aren't static, they flow, they change. So I want to argue then that at the heart of our relationships with the other should not be a fear of the other, as advocated by the Khmer Rouge, for instance, but rather a fear for the other, a fear for the other's well-being. A responsibility to practice aroha, this all-encompassing quality of goodness expressed by love for people, land, birds and animals, fish and all living beings, as Māori have taught me. A responsibility to practice what I as a Buddhist know as metta, or loving kindness for all beings, human or otherwise. I argue that we must pursue both biculturalism and multiculturalism precisely for these reasons. Biculturalism and multiculturalism are expressions of love for others. Um, but herein lies the ethical political challenge. How do I exercise my responsibility of love for the other and take seriously the other's very otherness when there is always already more than one other in the world? Um, I argue, leaning on Derrida, that there is a non-loving opening of love, a violent opening of love. If I am to exercise my responsibility of love for the other in ways that take the other's very otherness seriously, then I must betray or exclude my other others. Since, as Levinas reminds us, we are not a society of two, we are at least a three. 
That is, it is only through betraying or excluding my other others, even if for just a moment, that love for the other is possible. For instance, we inevitably betray other ethnic minorities, and indeed other Māori and Pākehā, in attempts to respond to bicultural commitments, if we understand biculturalism as a relationship between only Māori and Pākehā. Because I don't, I don't see Māori and Pākehā as all just being the same. I think even within groups, there are quite significant differences. We betray to some, out to, we betray to some extent our prior bicultural commitments with every attempt to see to multiculturalism, if multiculturalism is synonymous with multi-ethnicity, as is, as is the prevailing discourse in Aotearoa. In deciding to love, then, I must compare the incomparable, and thus I must betray and exclude. Love is not limited only to the realm of the good. Love is always already political. Love hurts. Betrayal and exclusion are, sim are not simply terminal crises or evils that we must somehow eliminate and for all. I think betrayal and exclusion too demand our hospitality. They too have valuable things to say. Betrayal and exclusion are at once the inextricable conditions for the very possibility and impossibility of love itself. Uh, however, I want to argue that our responsibilities of love for the other do not simply end there. I cannot simply exercise my responsibility of love for the other and simply regard betrayal or exclusion as an inevitable fate for my other others. I must turn to that and those that I have betrayed or excluded and attempt to see to my responsibility of love for them as well. I must strive for justice. That is, I must strive for love for the other other, or what Levinas calls the third party. Um, but yet I must also recognise that in turning towards the third, I have always already excluded the first, the fourth, the fifth, and so on and so forth. In being just, I am always already unjust. Um, and I just want to briefly turn to terminology for a bit. Um, one may well argue that biculturalism and multiculturalism in their present incarnations are not the best terms in the Aotearoa New Zealand context. As mentioned previously, biculturalism is too exclusive for some while multiculturalism is too inclusive for others. Biculturalism and multiculturalism also defy attempts at a singular reading or interpretation. However, I suggest we retain the terms biculturalism and multiculturalism precisely to embrace the multiplicity of their interpretation. The partial incommensurability of biculturalism and multiculturalism constitutes not an impasse in my view, but rather enables the very thing that democratic politics must continue to permit, that is, a love for and openness to difference. Um, but to provide space for both biculturalism and multiculturalism in and as policies, is not grounds to cement them as fixed, codified, and orthodox sets of principles that attempt to eliminate ambiguity. If we are to take differences seriously, we have to resist as far as possible this human desire for prescription and simple tick boxes. Rather, I argue that biculturalism and multiculturalism should be partially filled and partially empty. That is, we need some agreement about what they might mean, 
but this should be constantly challenged and contested in order to meet the contemporary in order to meet the demands of contemporary context what political theorist Chantal Muth might term a conflictual consensus. To paraphrase the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism and the contemporary of Confucius, we mold clay into pot, but it is the emptiness inside that makes the vessel useful. We fashion wood for a house, but it is the emptiness inside that makes it livable. I think the same argument applies here to biculturalism and multiculturalism. The strength of biculturalism and multiculturalism is that they remain partially filled and partially empty so that they can be challenged and contested in order to meet the demands of contemporary and different contexts. Um, by way of conclusion, I wanted to have a short presentation because I value more the discussions that come out of these, these meetings. Um, so by way, of form, by way of conclusion, formulated in the terms outlined here, there can be no point at which biculturalism and multiculturalism will be permanently closed and complete. No point at which all accounts can be settled once and for all love and biculturalism and multiculturalism is always being worked out, always being worked out, always to come one fine day. Although it's coming for the other as at once and necessarily are not coming for other others to whom I argue we must then turn. There are endless endings and every ending, just like this one, is just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Right, okay. So we're going to open up for questions or comments. Just um, so thank you, thank you, Lincoln. Have we got any um, questions or comments? I've got a question. I haven't sort of quite thought it out, but I'll go. So, Thank um, you. Yeah. <laughs> Just to Thank break, you, the, break the silence, yep. I'm reminded of something that Spivak said that was a, a strategy of familiarising one's otherness in terms of other others. Um, but thank you very much for your you know, really thoughtful presentation, and I particularly like the way you analysed um, the you know the war. That was really really powerful. Um, but I was wondering whether you had um, engaged at all with um, some of the sort of thinking of a treaty resource centre or treaty education that um, conceptualises the treaty in terms of tangata whenua and tangata tiriti. Um, and they sort of, um, you know, that's academics like, you know, Ingrid Huggins and um, Susan Healy and you know, various people, like, uh, Ray Mann, Jenny Rankin, you know, that have been very involved in the treaty education movement, would, would argue that the treaty is between um, Maui at the time and the Crown and that the Crown encompassed everybody. Mm. Um, and there was sort of a ragtag bunch of people at the time that came under British authority. Um, and, you know, I noticed that, you know, um, some Maori academics such as Tahi Kukatai and um, uh, Arama Rata are also using these, this sort of argument when they're talking about um, the importance of the treaty and immigration discourse. Um, and that that Maori have a role as host um, to welcome you know, newcomers, and that multiculturalism actually sits in 
Tanga to Tiriti, mm. whereas for Māori, they still are in the position of Tanga to Whenua as the original signature, you know, as one of the parties in the original signature. You know? I was just, um, we spoke briefly before, and mm. I'm sorry if this is sort of um, throwing you, because you did say that you, you were getting round to thinking a lot more about mm. how the treaty will work, but um, mm. I'm really curious as to how you see some of that fitting in with, with your work. Mm. Um, thank you very much for that question, mm. or those questions. Um, yeah, as we, as we talked about earlier, I haven't had a chance to look into um, those resources that you mentioned in particular, or, or in, in, in any real detail yet about how the treaty might fit into um, this bicultural and multicultural space, whatever that may look like. I guess my current interests or well, my primary current interests are around ethics and politics, but definitely um, that is an area, uh, the treaty is an area that I'm looking forward to getting into in, in, in more detail in, in months to come. Um, but I have um, seen people refer to Tangata Whenua and Tangata Tiriti, um, and I think that's an interesting way of framing I guess it sort of fits into that yin and yang. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. Um, and I guess why I've stuck with the terms, or why I've sort of kept, tried to keep people like myself um, and my parents, new migrants, for instance, out of this current discussion, is because I, I guess, for me, biculturalism represents a relationship from which, in its stricter sense, as in Māori Pākehā or Māori. Crown, I guess, but I guess others fall under the crown. But I, what I'm trying to say is, for us, I think we are necessarily excluded from that relationship, and I, I want to acknowledge that we are excluded from that relationship because we were not ourselves signatories to the treaty. Um, but I haven't thought about it in any further depth other than that at this stage. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um make some uh, comments and then ask a question yeah, yeah so um coming from a philosophical background i did uh, my thesis on john rawls and he talks about public reason you know so um i did a lot of work on work on multiculturalism but interestingly i, I never heard of biculturalism until i arrived mm -hmm. um new zealand i would think that something is multi once it's more than one mm -hmm. So if you talk about biculturalism, so it means you could have triculturalism, tetraculturalism, and we could continue until we get to a point we cannot uh, count it. So I would think if a country is not homogeneous, perhaps it automatically becomes um, um, multicultural. You know, uh, this binary from the bicultural, and I think it's very limiting. So my question is, um, so while I was doing my work, two years ago, uh, the Queen of Denmark announced during the new message that Denmark is a homogeneous country. Of course, you've got like 800,000 of the population in Denmark who are immigrants, and you still have like a second generation immigrants, first generation, and mm -hmm. people who've been there for like a century. So I wanted to ask, who makes the pronunciation, who defines a country as multicultural? Or homogeneous. I think in with the globalized uh, structure of the world, I wouldn't think there's any country that is not multicultural. So who who who, who describes a country fundamentally as homogeneous or multicultural? Is it academics? Is it the political class? Is it uh, the citizens, or is it just a discourse that people have among themselves? Mm. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay. I've never, I've never thought about it. Uh, mm. Can I open that question to the floor? Ooh. I, I, I find that. Sorry, what was your name? Oh, oh Valentine. Oh, Valentine. Nice yeah, to have well, you with us, Valentine. Yeah, so that can be that's yeah, fine. Valentine. That's fine. Um, because one of the things I, I look at is what is Pakeha identity and try and disrupt the notion of Pakeha as a, as thought of as a homogenous mm. identity, okay. and often those sort of white identities uh, become problematic where they're understood as a national identity. Mm, okay. And um, so a similar sort of vein is that 
you know, I guess the Pakeha could be looked at as multicultural. Yeah, mm. of course. Yeah, it's mm. another way of yeah. starting to disrupt this idea mm. of a mo- yeah. homogenous. Yeah. Mm. So that was that was my thinking when you were talking. Okay. Have we got any thoughts out there? You need to turn your mic on if you have a comment or a question. I don't know. Can, can you hear us? Oh, hello. Yes. yes. You can yes. hear us? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, we missed the start, but we had a problem with our speaker. Oh, yeah. we're glad you're here now. Yeah. Hi, Kia everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to return to the recognition of the extent of the other um, because and and the comment that was made by the previous speaker about Maori as host um, one of the things that I think has come through is the essential part of played by place and what Pākehā people call the environment you know and the sense that it is actually first the land that welcomes the people and then the indigenous people who learn to live with the land uh, and in this country you know had to and, and in this country came to terms with kaitiakita a way to be with the land um, by the time the, the next lot come along with any uh, concentration that lesson has been learned. And so the, the manakitanga, the hosting, is offered in the context of an understanding of kaitiakitanga. And I think that your, your recognition of the connection between love and politics is essential. So I just want to thank you for putting those two words together because I think we often miss the, the political side of of, of of love and and it's very it's a it's quite a discipline and it's about that's where the koha and tuku and other uh, uh, concepts actually uh, are meaningful so thank you, thank you <laughs> um, but also do work more on that i'm reminded of a, a researcher of whom i'm very fond miles horton who started the highlander center in, in tennessee and he he talked about how you know when you've got, let's call it democracy, you know when you've got people feeling that they're in, involved in something or other, um, making decisions, I suppose, <coughs> because they will feel they are setting the agenda. Mm-hmm. And at the moment, I think the politics of where people are located, they just don't feel they're setting the agenda. Mm-hmm. So this capacity to use the, the connection between being loving and love and politics is, is a way of reclaiming <coughs> the capacity to set the agenda. So, you know, I think it's a really important um, connection that you're making and, and would encourage you to, to deepen it and share that with us. Thank you <laughs> so very much. Just, just a, a thank you for, for what you're doing and thank making you. us think. Um, can we, I don't think we can be who we are except in relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, agree. Mm. We agree. We agree. Can, can we have your names, please? Sorry. Uh, uh, I'm Kathy Duncan, and this is Catherine Pete. Thanks, guys. Hi. Great to have you with us. Where are yeah, you guys yeah. from, Kathy? Uh, we're yes. with Network Waitangi Ototahi. Yes. We're involved in treaty work. We're based in we're in Christchurch. Yeah. Sure. Just as an aside, when we talk about, in um, our work, we talk about treaty-based multiculturalism. Mm. Mm. Um, Where the indigenous status of tangata whenua is understood. So that connection with the land, because one older person said to me a long time ago, really, indigeneity is something to do with the fact that the people who have it, the, the indigenous people's languages, plural, around the world, are the first languages to name the Mm. place. Mm. And so therefore, within the linguistic traditions of of that language, everything is connected to everything else. You know, the karakaberi is orange. 
Mm. The, the hekurangi is blue. The sky is blue. It's it's sort of like kind of makes sense. It's, it's sort of you know, <laughs> it's not not difficult kind of thing. It's only when you get these these hybrids of languages that come in with all those advantages. It's not a question of one being good and one being bad. They just have something to contribute. So the dynamic quality of what you was to what you were, mm. it's also really important. Mm. It gives meaning yeah. when it comes together. But that's, what, that's why I think we've got an enormously wonderful possibility in this country mm. because we've got two different worldviews beginning to genuinely converse, mm. you know, beginning, mm. slowly, slowly. Thank you. Thank you. Last question, Joa. Um, thinking about biculturalism and multiculturalism, first of all, the way I, I tend to think about them is as, as tools of governance in the first instance. So they're not necessarily just there, you know, there's not just two groups of people in a bicultural sense, or so there's not just a number of groups of people in a multicultural sense, like I associate multiculturalism, for example, with Blairism in the first instance. You know, it was a very much a tool of that early 90s sort of neoliberal project, if you like, as much as it was. And, and even with biculturalism, that emerged out of a, a, a really uh, strong, uh, treaty-based activism of the 70s and 80s and these sorts of things. So the kind of the isms or the ideologies that emerge come from these other periods of uh, intense social unrest and activism and and all the rest. And and so that's, that's how I see biculturalism and multiculturalism as these sort of techniques. So I'm interested in this idea of love then in that context because what what does it mean for love to be a technique of governance in the same way? If it is to offer the kind of um, scale of effects, I guess, is what you've identified with biculturalism, multiculturalism, when it, I guess we have a way, and certainly in the, in the West at least, of love being a very intimate relationship between two people, mm -hmm. um, but sort of scaling that up. And that's where I get a bit nervous with love, because um, mm -hmm. I've seen it a lot lately. You know, that your love for your nation, your country, your... You know, it also can invoke some very, very conservative um, perspectives. You know, I'm sure a lot of, I'm sure Pol Pot mm. and Khmer Rouge talked about yeah. love a lot yeah. when they were exterminating people because they love their nation and they wanted yeah. to keep, yeah. you know, so I'm interested. So what, what does love look like in a, in, in a more, in a, at a sense of scale, but doesn't necessarily fall back on some of those more uh, conservative and violent practices that purge that outside? Mm. Sorry, that's a pretty big question. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Question. Um, I guess, can I take the concept of the, the word love first, I suppose? Mm. And I had this, I asked myself those questions too. Mm. Um, and in the end, I chose the word love precisely for all of that ambiguity, precisely for all of that in all of those interpretations um, and then some people came back to me and said well do you mean love in the eros sense or the you know, agape, agape whatever mm. um, and I guess I don't know um, I, I'm not I'm not really fussed about trying to nail mm. things down so much because in doing so we end up or we amplify the exclusion of the very difference that we're trying to include mm. and so I guess for me I chose the word very loosely. Mm. Um, I wonder then, is there a role for a, a more conscious love that chooses what it wants to exclude so that mm. it isn't just love? Because, you know, I've, I've been in a number of conversations where people invoke love mm. in a conflict, for example, mm. to mm. make that conflict mm. go away. You know, why can't we just all love each other mm. sort of thing, mm. you know? And, mm. and in so doing, it flattens out what is potentially a very productive relationship mm. emerging. Mm -hmm. But especially for privileged people to invoke love is to also put up a bit of a, a wall uh, mm -hmm. at times. Mm -hmm. And I guess is that diff it's, a, it's a differentiated field or, or concept or mm -hmm. assemblage of different placeholders and people. Mm -hmm. you know, like, and that's why I guess I'm just pushing you to understand a bit more what it looks like in, in a field of relationships. Mm -hmm. um, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the short answer is I don't know. Yeah. Um, and actually, I, I, the I don't know is for me that leaving it open, let's, let's leave it for whatever that relationship that we're mm. dealing with 
let's leave it for that relationship to decide. Um, but I, I guess these are preliminary thoughts. I'm, I'm obviously I've, I've got a lot more thinking to do, and I would be keen to see what where people take this idea that I've proposed mm -hmm. um, and what it might look like in, in, in practice. Um, but I, I'm again, I'm just dealing with I guess very abstract thoughts at the moment, but not abstract in a bad way. I think abstract in order to keep open space for particularity later on. Mm -hmm. I, I know that that, that doesn't... I, I, I mean, I got that that last bit was good. So there's a space for particularity. Mm. So that, that is a feature of love. Yeah, so for me, it's that ambiguity that keeps open space for the particularity. Right. And I guess that's why I've, I've not been so, at this point, been so fussed about trying to Mm. Nail down precisely what these things should look like or, mm. or, or might look like. Mm. I guess I'm leaving that open for the context. Mm. Can I add something? Yes, Jessica. Right. Uh, thank you, Lincoln, first of all, as uh, lots of interesting points in your talk to pick up on and to develop further. Uh, and I, I talked about what Susan said earlier about the treaty relationship, of course, being quite central to how we might conceptualize biculturalism and how that will develop further into a future in a post-settlement era, what will be the role of the treaty and how will migrants <clears throat> uh, and how we fit into that. And I also want to pick up on what Jacob said. I think it's a really good point. I think of biculturalism and multiculturalism also as, as political concepts and governance concepts. Um, and I'm wondering, and I know you're coming from a philosophical perspective, whether it is worth um, contextualizing those concepts, though, in current politics, um, uh, what you said about uh, moving from a fear of the other to fear for the other reminded me of Ghassan Haj's argument around uh, Australia having become a nation of white warriors. So people who worry. Uh, and they worry for the nation because of the love for the nation, but then they worry, <laughs> you know, the fear is about the other destroying <clears throat> that mm -hmm. nation and he puts it down to, largely down to the decline of the welfare state and neoliberalism uh, as enabling, well, or hindering, I guess, <laughs> that love uh, and that ethics of care that Lavinas will be talking yeah. about. So I'm wondering about your contextualization, let's say, of these abstract ideas around, well, biculturalism, multiculturalism, love and politics. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Jessica, for that question. Um, I guess that's, that's the next chapter I've got to write on my PhD, is what, <laughs> what these ideas might look like in, in practice, or what they already look like in practice. Um, I haven't got there just yet. So fortunately, I'm not able to offer a very substantial response to your question. Um, but maybe come back to me in six months time. <laughs> and hopefully I have something for you. <laughs> Another presentation in <laughs> 219. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Have we got anyone else um, out there with a question or a comment? I think there's a comment from somebody from class to everyone. Jacob, can you read that? Sorry, I can't. I would suggest that love it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're you there. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Can you see it? We can see it if you want. Okay. Can you read it, Judy? Oh. I would suggest that love is the inclusion of the other. When it is framed in terms of love of one's nation, and typically a very single minded, homogenous nation, the sense of homogeneity leads to a rejection of the yin-yang uniting of duality. Much in, much in how it was said in the West that I, dis oh, that, and I've got a comment, I, I disagree with you, but will defend to the death your right to say it, close quotes. We may be opposed culturally, but I believe that Dallas point to be made is that this opposition is to be welcomed. Though it can be cliche, it is the differences of the other that unite us brash and such that you referred to at the start, use claims to unity to move towards separatism and adherence to yin at the exclusion to yang, a false unity. Thank you, Clark. Thank we, you, have, Clark. we have Clark there. We might be able to hear from Clark if Clark um, turns, turns their mic on. 
even if we can't see you? Clark's in the library. Ah, oh, he's in the library. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Jacob. <laughs> Lincoln, Thank did you, you Clark, did you want to comment on that, Lincoln? Yeah. To Clark? He's in the there library. There's a lot in there. Yes, um, he was. <laughs> Pick up on this. Um, Any might resonate might more. <laughs> You're probably going to read that, read his comment as well. <laughs> that was long. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah. a long. Oh, thank, thank you, Clark. It was um, very profound. It, yeah. Yep. And I, yeah, Would I'd, you like to email it to yeah, me? Yeah. If you can email it to me, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yes. Uh, I can see the end. Oh. You go first, Robin. Oh, okay. Um, just coming back to that question about the binary versus the um, whatever it was you were putting in opposition to the binary, I think there's a real difference between that idea of the other that's suggested in the Taoist symbol, which seems to be the idea that the other is plural and imbricated, whereas the binary is always oppositional. And if you think about how the binary is represented as the term and the slash and the term, but there's a space between the term and the slash and the term, um, it doesn't have that uh, unity within diversity that the Taoist symbol represents. And I think it's probably, um, it's probably tricky to to talk about um, biculturalism if it's going to be an effective term in any shape or form as a binary. So I think what you're trying to do in terms of um, interrogating the multiplicities within the binaries, no, the multiplicities within biculturalism, that's, that's um, really useful, but defaulting back to calling it a binary probably is in my sense yeah yeah I, I i agree with you and i guess it was just out of a comment from a previous presentation um someone was just saying that i, I seem to be um reinforcing binaries and i i was a bit unsure about that because i don't think that what i'm doing is reinforcing binaries and i guess i just wanted to wanted to hear what others um today thought about uh, what i have proposed. I think we've got time for one more comment or question. Oh, Warwick was going to ask a yeah. question. Oh, it was a follow-up from, from Jacobs, really, and it, it is another take on this question of what happens when love is elevated to a political principle. And, and my question concerns, how do you think we might protect the self, the subject, from becoming a rigid thing in the midst of that. I mean, I was, my and Papa involves having been born into a Christian family where love was, even love was the thing. But sitting around that, well, there were a whole lot of unwritten rules and regulations about how to be. And, and my sense was I, I, I grew to really mistrust even the nicest, most liberal people when they pronounced love because of this you know, subjects that would be running. And the subjects would be invariably in terms of the Christian tradition I was brought up on, they would be bourgeois and they would be white and they would be masculinist and they would be disavowed, you know, they would just be pushed under, but they surface and practices of the culture. Because my concern is always that, that the um, almost, if you have a, a, an elevation of love to that kind of state, there's the possibility that the self becomes quite rigid in it as it's trying to hold away the disavowal of the things and it's that it's the, that body is practicing all the time that are quite antithetical to love so i'm just wondering how yeah how do you how do you see that the self can be protected from the rigidities that can set in around love I guess the short answer is I've not thought about it from that perspective. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, I mean, because it holds our imaginary so much yeah. that we've not exhausted our possibilities, but I'm just reflecting on my own kind of experience of having grown up in a culture of love, but seeing so much that is other than love 
Yeah. Culture. Yeah. Conditional. Mm -hmm. I think it have to do with making like a very deep conceptual analysis of your <laughs> idea of love. You know, that would be like a ground for whatever you're going to do because mm -hmm. you know, whatever is the idea of love. Mm -hmm. So you need to really define it explicitly. Um, the concept of love you're talking about and how it reflects what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and at the same time, which you seem to be doing this afternoon, is, is resisting someone else yeah. telling you what mm. love is. Yeah, you exactly. seem to do that a lot this afternoon mm. in your response, mm. yeah. which I think is, it's the, as you said, the tension is important. Mm. Yeah. We, we're going to close here. Thank you, Warwick, for that. Um, and I was also thinking back to what Jessica was saying, going to the ethics of care, and maybe it's about the ethics of love as well, and, and trying to determine what you're meaning in this space. Um, so thank you, everyone.